Mic'd up. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Hall of Fame Conversations brought to you by the Florida Sports Hall of Fame. I'm joined today by Florida Sports Hall of Famer Barry Smith. And we have a special guest today uh, in, in the Florida Sports Hall of Fame for soccer. Uh, it's Winston DuBose. Winston, welcome to Hall of Fame Conversations. Thank you. I'm just one of the few, one of the few soccer people in there. So, you know, it's, this is a rare interview. Very rare. Very and very deserving. Yeah. Very deserving. Well, for our listeners out there, the purpose of these uh, podcasts here is we actually have, are going to attach these to our website, uh, the Florida Sports Hall of Fame website. It's www.flasportshof.org, and that's our website out there. And for our listeners out here, too, in case you miss uh, some of the rest of the podcast, uh, the link will be up on all of our Florida Sports Hall of Fame social media. And this podcast is brought to you by, by Mike Depp, and uh, they're the folks that are allowing us to have these wonderful interviews. So... Uh, with our listeners, we just want to introduce again Winston DuBose. Uh, now, you know, there's probably three pages of biography on Winston, but in general, you know, we can small say pages, that. Small uh, John. Very small pages. Well, I'll tell you what. When you have your own Wikipedia out there, you have your own Wikipedia page, you have made it. I mean, I Absolutely. still don't have enough out there for a Wikipedia page yet, but you Absolutely. do. But, uh, but yeah, your University of Central Florida, uh, U.S. Men's National Team. Uh, North American Soccer League, particularly in the Tampa Bay area, the, the Tampa Bay Rowdies. And I know there's a lot more to your career uh, on that. So why don't you just give us a quick rundown of, uh, of your soccer career? Okay, well, I can briefly do that in about three sentences. No, what, fortunately, you know, I grew, I'll try to be brief. I grew up in Orlando and went to a parochial school there called Trinity Prep. I went to uh, UCF, which previously was called Florida Technological University, and it had about four buildings, a man and its dog, and about 12,000 people when I went there back from 73 to 77. But the, the fascinating thing is that there's a coach there named Jim Rudy, who a uh, young coach from Rollins College. He graduated from, he loved soccer, and um, he had a successful co college coaching career aside from UCF, but um, uh, during that time, he was, he really helped me a lot as a soccer player, as a goalkeeper, and um, as a result, uh, I think I was, I think I'm their first All-American and three-time All-American, so there's not many in the soccer category or in the athletic category that that happened to, but I was very fortunate, thank God for that, and then I got drafted by Tampa, and the Rowdies were one of the best teams, if not the best team in the North American Soccer League during its heyday, probably from 77 to 84. So I played in Tampa, two soccer balls. Uh, we lost both of them, unfortunately. But we had very good teams, a lot of attendance, and had played some of the best players in the world against them. Pele, Johan Cruyff, George Best, Johan Nijkins, Canalia. I mean, you name them, they came to this country to play during those times, Franz Beckenbauer, excellent players, and they weren't 50 years old when they came here either. And we had no slouches on our team. Rodney Marsh, excellent player, Steve Waverly, and I think uh, Peter Anderson. We had some of the best American players, North American, Wes McLeod, Perry Vanderbeck, people like that. And I think that was our strength as a team. I got traded to Tulsa, and that's where we won a championship in 83. And during those years, I was fortunate enough to get selected to play in the national team, the men's national team. Well, the two nemesis were Mexico and Canada. Um, as things go, we never qualify for the World Cup because they were just better teams than we were. As time rolls on 30 years later, things have changed. In the U.S. is probably top in the group with now Canada, as they call it, the HEX, uh, the eight teams in CONCACAF. So... You know, I managed to play from 79 to 85 on the national team, and it was never full-time. It was always in the fall, and um, World Cup venues, World Cup qualifications. So, um, and I also, during that time, had an opportunity to play in the U.K. and trained and played in the reserves for Southampton and Ipswich Town. And then I had the opportunity to play, to play at a... Um, second division team called Oldham, which is um, Joe Royal coached it, very famous English coach, 
Willie Donahue was the second command. And I, it was a loan agreement in 88 with Tampa and Oldham. And fortunately, I think I was the first American to, to do that. Now, since then, Americans hard, it's hard still, you know, have played in England, you know, at, at the top tier. And you are be familiar with Pulisic and Weston McKinney and Aronson. Some of the goalkeepers would be Casey Keller, Brad Friedel, Tim Howard more recently. So they all had great careers. And, um, and after that, um, I pretty much finished the Rowdies, played in a league called APSL, American Professional Soccer League, played in there, had some all-star um, uh, berths in that league and finished up in 92 when I was, you know, kind of old and feeble at 36. So um, that was um, briefly in a nutshell. And uh, from there, we didn't make much money when we were, we were playing at that in those times. Um, not complete. I understand that. I understand that, Winston. The NFL wasn't paying anything either. I think you're right. I think baseball, um, if I'm right, around 1977, I think the average salary in Major League Baseball, believe it or not, was around 25000 in 1977. It's changed drastically. I'm sure in the NFL, it's the same thing. Um, the unions probably weren't even established back then. That helped a ton in getting you know wages and minimums up. More importantly, health care. So uh, I, I really, you know, what, what are you going to do? And um, I did have some money, but, you know, you're not going to live on that the rest of your life. And fortunately, uh, another uh, friend of mine, Peter Anderson, who played with me on the Rowdies, and as a friend and another gentleman, Frank Mann, we started uh, Bayshore Technologies. Prior to that, I worked for a man, Mark Lindsay, who had a company called Megabyte International, all computer-related HP, Citrix, Microsoft. So when Peter I and Frank started the company in 1997, um, we started with little capital and we grew it to 50 people and sold it at a $37 million revenue in 2012. And um, so we were very fortunate and I really enjoyed that a lot from a business perspective. And, um, you know, it, it taught me a lot in the business world. Peter's an excellent businessman. And my other partner, Frank Mann, was excellent with services. So at that time, our company um, uh, managed to do very well in this market, in the Central Florida market. So we were very proud of that. Um, and that probably brings me up to uh, when we got bought out. I finished up in 2015 with the company that bought us which at that time was called Bology. And we stayed there for a while and that was it. So now I'm you know, fortunate and um, blessed to be able to do things that I really want to do, which is still keeping a hand in youth soccer and um, also working in, uh, with the Boys and Girls Clubs on a program for young men and women, seven, eight, nine years old, teaching them soccer with some people like Perry Vanderbeck is helping me and other soccer folks. Uh, we're trying to build that out around the Tampa area, do some work with an organization called 68 Hours of Hunger, which is delivering food to different um, schools in the Hillsborough County area. The, the premise being no food on the weekend, 68 hours for some of these kids. So um, there's a lot of really good sponsors that help with that. Um, those type of things, um, I'm also involved with C.S. Lewis Society, which is a Christian apologetics um, organization. So, yeah, those things all keep me busy um, at the present time. Plus, to um, Janet Wing, my girlfriend, she's, you know, kind of drives me crazy, too. So it's all, <laughs> it's all good. You guys you're also playing. You're also playing a little bit of golf. A little bit. Yeah. Very just enough to just enough. Just enough to keep my 11 or 12 index intact. I do love <laughs> golf. I do love it. And I met a lot of great people um, through golf. And um, at one time, Wes McLeod and, and I had a foundation that we did golf tournaments to benefit life-threatening illnesses like ALS and right. um, American lung, Moffitt cancer, things like that. Um, we've since um, not doing that uh, in a while, but... 
Yeah, that was, um, I, I do, I love that game. You can never, well, I mean, remember the greatest game in the world was soccer, but golf's a very close second, that's for sure. Well, remember, we got a standing game here at Pasadena as soon as you can free up. Oh, no, 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 no. I know. I got I, 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 I love to play with Mr. Smith because he likes music in the car and he's freewheeling. So it, it's, it's great. <laughs> there you go. Well, you know, that's fantastic to hear. You know, Winston, uh, Barry and I, throughout the years, we've been involved with uh, different organizations. One of them is the NFL alumni. And one of the yeah. key things about the NFL alumni is that former players and a lot of the players don't play that long. Yeah, they may only play two, three years, four years to be vested in the pension plan. And so there's a career after uh, after their competitive football. In the same way with the PJ of America, you know, you play the PJ tour, but if you don't pan out there, what do you do? Well, you might join the PJ of America and it teaches you how the business side of the game of golf and allows you to extend your career. So one of the key things we've noticed that are really good with athletes, athletes are really great in business. And, uh, and, and I think I know some of the reasons why, but uh, you were really great in business, too, and you're a great athlete. So what attributes did you take from the world of competitive soccer and bring them into your successful business career? Hmm, that's a really good question. I think there's something that people normally don't talk about. And I don't know if Barry experienced that. Or you experienced it during his career. You, 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 you're motivated a lot, believe it or not, by fear of failure. There's no... There's no real backup when you're playing it, sports are great to be in. Number one, it's hard to get there yep. and it takes a, a, it takes a lot of other people helping you to get there. Just not yourself, believe it or not. And then to stay there is tough, but the fear of failure is huge. At least the more successful people I know. Yes, that's huge. I think if you ask anybody in soccer or anybody in golf, they don't want to, I mean, they don't want to fail. They don't want to go back. I mean, they, they, they want to make the, the cut. They want to get paid on that Sunday, you know, and, and have a good tournament. They want to stay. So that's one. I think that brings the other side of it brings in as a business side of it. You're out there. You have no VC. It's your own money. You got to work your butt off and you got to use the time appropriately. You don't want to fail. You just turn around and you go, you got 10 people you're supporting, and now 15 people, and now 20, 30, 40. It just keeps getting bigger. And you, it, it, does it get easier? I don't know if it ever gets easier, but it certainly gets, gets to a point where, where you can, uh, you know, you, you, don't, you don't have to run around like a chicken with your head cut off doing every single thing. But the fear of failure is huge to me in that as well. So, um, you know, and it also taught me a lot. You know, it's it's really funny. The harder you work, the luckier you get. And I think it's the same in sports. I think it's the same. You see the gifted ones in sports. You turn around, they can't miss. But for some reason, they do miss. And um, a lot of times they take that, that for granted. And they take your athletic ability for granted, being on that team for granted. And that's something that I know that, I never took that for granted, and I always want, prided myself on trying to be the hardest worker and just outworking other people that were better than I was or more talented than I was. And fortunately, that did occur to me in, in several times in my career, and, and it worked good for me. And I think the same thing in business, just giving your all and just outworking the competition is, um, is huge. I think, because a lot of people nowadays, they want to clock in at eight and leave at five, and it's just not good enough. To me, if you want to be really successful, that's just my humble opinion on it. I don't know how Barry feels about it. Love it. Love it. Winston, uh, here's a question I always want to ask you, and for some reason I, I never do. You obviously were an outstanding athlete. We'll, we'll say, we'll put it in the past that we can roll. Intensive yeah. purposes, yes. Okay, but number one, being a three-time All-American is huge. You know, I mean, you're fortunate if you become an All-American one time, so you're three-time. Obviously, you're a great athlete. You're born and raised there in the Orlando. My question to you, especially back then, why did you go, you know, why didn't you go into football or baseball or something like that because you are a gifted athlete. And then what was your journey 
what determined that you went down the soccer path? That's a really good question, Barry. So I love baseball. My dad was a big baseball guy. He um, he actually knew Leo DeRocher. He was at the World Series wow. with the Giants when they played. And um, he was a big baseball guy. And he had me in Little League, Pony, Big League. I love baseball. And there were, I think, towards the end of towards the end of my high school time, there was a couple of teams that were interested, but I cut, but what happened was in my junior year in high school, I didn't start soccer until I was 15, 16. I was playing baseball all the time, okay. but uh, my friends in high school said, we need a goalkeeper. Why don't you come out and play? And that's how that happened. And so I love football too. I never played organized football at, or organized basketball, but I loved all those sports. The difference varies kind of, I kind of felt that I love catching the ball. I love being wide receiver like you were in football yeah, man. and yep. quarterbacks throwing the ball to me when, you know, messing around and stuff like that. So I managed to take all of that and just, I love diving around. I love going up for balls, crosses, like you would catch something over the middle. It would be the same for me going up for crosses. I love that. I love snagging those balls. I loved um, working hard. I loved the energy and the and the diving and the whole thing and the kicking and the distribution. So that kind of got to me. And I think there was a big game. Um, I grew up in Winter Park. So it was a big game, Young, that probably set me on that path. I was still playing baseball in big league and high school. Big league was equivalent to American Legion back then. And... Um, the interesting thing for me was we went to 10 overtimes in the, in the county championship against Winter Park High. And it was, we were bombarded by Winter Park. They were clearly the better team, but I just happened on the day to have a really good day. And they beat us 1-0 in like the 10th overtime. And everybody made a big deal out of it, including the Winter Park High coach, who eventually coached me at FTU, Jim Rudy. So... That kind of set me on that path. So when my dad said, you got to pick one or the other, I went, you know, I'm a decent fielder. I, I hit the ball okay, but I don't know that, you know, I'm a major league guy to go out and hit, bang out all the home runs and do all that. I, I like this sport. And so it kind of, you know, it was something that, that, that kind of grew in, into me. So I had to give my baseball up. And um, gave gave my uniform to the big league coach, and, he said, and I gave it to him. And he went, "You're crazy." Uh, <laughs> I went, well, yeah. Well, my father told me I had to pick one or the other, so um, I picked soccer. And so he really made me, in a good way, kind of focus on one thing. You know, I was not a Bo Jackson, or you know, could do everything and all that stuff. So I wasn't ever at that kind of caliber. So. He made me pick. I think it made me focus. And I think it, it really, he really helped me. He was a general in the Air Force. So he, he was very focused on, on that. And, and you can't do everything. Pick one. So, you know, thank God it worked out well for me. It did it well. Hey, Winston, uh, Winston, I got a question for you here. I just, it just came along. Now, this is more of a uh, technical question. And I've sure. always admired uh, goalkeepers because – you know, there's such a fine line there between guessing where the ball is going to go, reacting where the ball is going to go, yeah. uh, even have that intuition where the ball is going to go. Mm -hmm. what, what, what in the world goes on when, because uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a split second. You have to decide what to do, where to jump, where to block, what to do. What, right. what goes on in your mind there? What happens in that, those instances? <sighs> That's a good question. I think just like Barry did when he was doing it in your prepare, I think preparation is huge. So you get more, the more games you play and the more you're thrown into that environment. Sure. The first few games, um, you know, Eddie Fermani put me in, in 77 when they were, you know, we were winning four zero against Connecticut. He said, just don't screw it up. He didn't use <laughs> screw it up. He used a different word, but Eddie Fermani. So, you know, he put me in with only 16 minutes left. So I couldn't do, but, yeah, I, you're 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 you know you're not even prepared for that because it's your first professional game. You hope you know what you're doing in practice is good enough. 
I didn't play much my rookie year. There was a better goalkeeper in front of me, Paul Hammond. But my the, the point is, is that, yeah, you, you just like Barry, I'm sure, in his first NFL game, you know, you go out there the first preseason, you're, wow. I mean, everything's faster, quicker. But, I mean, everything moves faster. And no, 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 no amount of practice helps. So you got to play games. And I think to answer your question, in when you prepare and practice for game as many game situations as you can and work as hard as you can, you go in there feeling pretty good. If you if you fail to prepare, prepare to fail, right? A friend of mine, Ron Fritcher, told me that. Very good soccer player. So that is huge for me. And I think um, Barry might agree with that. And I think as you play on and on and you get used to, you know, the environment and it's not so daunting anymore and you can concentrate on those those moments that you almost kind of slow things down in your mind. And I've heard other people say that, other really, you know, different sports. Things just go slower for you and they just, you're able to laser focus on certain things and that is that helped me a lot. I mean... Plus two, when you're playing, you know, like when players are coming at you from different angles because you practice, you want them doing certain things if they're right-footed or left-footed to make it hard on them and make it easier on you. So you play the odds, right? So if there's a right-footed player coming down the field all alone, say, for instance, you don't go and stand on his left foot and let him have a right-footed shot you stand on his right foot. Make him play the hard shot across your body. That's an example, right? Just an example of something. And I think the more situations you get in and um, the more comfortable and familiar you are. It's like um, in sales too. The more objections you get and you're used to answering objections because you've heard, about, heard them 500 times before, it's more comfortable for you. And I think that's the same way it is in golf when you're in match play. I mean, you're playing a match for your club. I mean, I'm, you're nervous, but I guess the more matches you play, the more comfortable you are in that situation. You know what I'm saying, John? I mean, I played this fall for TPC in match play. I didn't win a match, but I learned a lot, you know, and you kind of learn a lot about yourself and how to cope with that. So if I get the opportunity another time, hopefully I can, you know, do a little bit better. That's all I think. So. Well, you know, the hardest, uh, the hardest shot in golf actually for, uh, for golfers, uh, especially competitive golfers is the tee shot on number one, yeah. uh, the first shot of the day. And I'll tell you why, because if you're not really ready just to absolutely go throw up, you're just not into it yet. <laughs> and so you got to be careful. But once That's you hit that first point. shot, you're down the fairway, you're good to go. You know, you're good to go the rest of the day, but it's that first shot. Especially, uh, you're talking about your rookie year and getting thrown into a game. It's like uh, you're playing in your first tour event, and, uh, and you're, you happen to be teeing off at a busy time for some reason. And everybody's starting to peer over the gallery ropes down the fairway on the right. first hole to see who's teeing off, right? You know, right. it, gets pretty, it gets pretty narrow there, and you're just you're wondering about, okay, what kind of liability policy do I have yeah. with, this, with this tournament? And go yeah, from there. I hope the PGA has a good one. Yep, that's yeah. for sure. No, hey, one, thing I wanted local, to, one thing I wanted to ask you about. Oh, go ahead, Barry. Hey, Winston, uh, mm -hmm. I, got a, I got a question for you. Sure. Your, your rookie year, okay, your rookie year or your, the first couple of years. What was your biggest wow? Okay, your biggest wow either your biggest moment, the biggest game, or the stadium, the crowd, the the the, the uh, international players who were like Pele, whatever. What, what right. was wow factor? Ooh, that's a really good question too, Barry. Um, probably the 1978 Soccer Bowl because um, I played in that game and it was 78 or 80,000 in Giant Stadium against the New York Cosmos. Well, we had played the Cosmos several times before, but their players were Franz Beckenbauer, Carlos Alberto, Escandarian, all international players, Giorgio Canalia. I mean, they had Bogicevic. They had players that were world-class, and you're playing on AstroTurf, 
And um, that would be, to me, a big wow moment because that is that was yep. the final. You know, we finished second in the league that year. It's a final. Not that we hadn't played those guys before or I hadn't played against them before, but that was huge. Um, it was huge for me. I mean, from that perspective, there were other wild moments along the way. I mean, another thing would be when I was uh, just the year before, when I was at Southampton, they had some of the best players in England playing at Southampton, and I trained with those guys every day. It was Chris Nickel, Irish International, Alan Ball, England International, played in the England World Cup in 66, Peter Osgood, England International, Bill Boyer, these guys, Stevie Williams, these guys, oh my gosh, they were some of the best players in Europe and you're training with them. So it would be like, you know, you, you know, practicing immediately and then playing a championship game, you would Bart Starr or, you know, I mean, those guys, that, that type of caliber straight away. And so those guys in Ipswich had a world-class team when I went there and Bobby Robson, who was one of the best managers ever in England, um, allowed me to come there and train. And it was all England internationals, all of them. I mean, the best players at that time in Europe and in England. Uh, so it, it was uh, phenomenal. And we were very fortunate in Tampa, too. We had some of the best players at that time in the North American Soccer League and coming from England, like Rodney Morris is an example. Steve Wagerly, uh, Adrian Alston, Derek Smethers, all of these guys um, were very, very, very good and accomplished. And so you're training with them right there. So there were a lot of little wow moments, but I guess that's the first big one. And maybe the other one would maybe be playing for the national team the first time or playing at Azteca in front of, I think, 100,000 in a World Cup qualifier against Mexico. We lost, unfortunately. But it was the World Cup qualifier against Mexico, and that was a big deal for us. Sweet. Well, Winston, uh, I got one final question for you here, uh, and uh, we appreciate your time here on the Florida really? Sports Hall of Fame Hall of Fame conversations. Um, so, it, these days, it seems like no matter what sport you play, athletes now have an entourage. They have a, you know, they have a trainer and a physical therapist, and they have a dietitian, and they have a oh, yeah. psychologist, and you know, <coughs> and it, it, it just, it just, a masseuse. Yeah, you got to have one of those oh, if you're yeah, in this yeah. day and age, but. Can't um, live without the masseuse, yeah. Mm. So, uh, you know, is that does that make them better today than they uh, that they played in your day? Does that make them any better as as athletes, or is you know, that something that's, that's just overblown? That's a great overblown? question because that is a great question. I'm sure Barry's had that question before. And my answer, and I've talked to my contemporaries and talked to other people. I think my take on it is this: is that if you were able to play in the NFL back then or when Barry played, or Joe Namath, or Bart Starr, or Johnny Unitas, those guys could still play today in the NFL. Don't forget, my opinion is this, is that if they have this, this, the football intelligence, or IQ they call it, they did not, they would be able to take advantage of everything that's given to them now. That means the weight room, the nutrition, the masseuse, the days off, the whole nine yards. And I mean, so so I, I firmly believe, although, you know, all the sports have changed a lot, every one of them to a T over the last 30 or 40 years in their methodology, but there's no doubt that you wouldn't, that you would, um, uh, that you would turn around and, and they would be able to play in today's game. There's no doubt about it. If you're good enough to play then, you're going to be good enough to play now. It's just you would be growing up in a different time. That's all. I mean, can you imagine, Barry, Sonny Jurgensen oh. used to get down with the Redskins on one knee, and he'd be drawing stuff on the ground. He'd be bringing his, eye, he'd be bringing his Microsoft tablet to the field and yep. drawing stuff out of the tablet, throwing it away, and then throwing the ball. I mean, that's how crazy it is. They go back to, they go back to the tablets all the time. Baseball, everybody... I'm sure I'm going, what happens to putting your hand on the receiver's shoulder pad or going up to the defender and saying, you can't do that. You got to mark them this way. Or yeah. baseball, you know, don't, you know, be looking for that curveball on the, you know, 
coming with a three two or whatever it is, or or Barry, that guy's playing you this way. You gotta, you know, next time I'm gonna throw it to you on your other shoulder. You know, what happened to that? It's all we they all go and look at their iPads now. Right. It's it's totally different, but those guys, so as an example, a very famous golfer here, Gary Coke, right? Everybody knows That's Gary Coke. Nice guy, great. There's no doubt about it. Gary Coke could play in today's PGA. He would just be a little bit different. He would, you know, eat a little bit different and do things differently. But there's no, no, no doubt in my mind. He, you know, and that means he's growing up. You know, many years later, but he would still be able to play in the PGA Tour without a doubt. I mean, I, I have no, no doubt about those things. Well, that's just uh, great stuff there. You know, in the world of golf, uh, what you just talked about. Uh, with the tablets, we call that paralysis by analysis. Oh, so you get yeah. too much information going. Well, let's we'll go ahead and wrap things up here. So for our listeners out there, you've been listening to Hall of Fame Conversations uh, brought to you by the Florida Sports Hall of Fame. Uh, if you want to go visit our website and, and watch this uh, podcast, you go to uh, www.flasportshof.org. And you also want to download the Mic'd Up app. And you'll be able to replay this uh, over and over and over and share with your friends and families out there on the social media. So, Winston, uh, we really appreciate your time today. We appreciate you being on. And uh, we look forward to uh, getting you out on the links. Uh, it sounds like uh, you might need to give us all two shots aside with your golfing prowess since you're playing well, a lot of golf. I, no, I don't think that's the case. Will it ever be the case, but we'll have a lot of fun, that's for sure. We'll have a blast. All right, everybody. So, Winston, thank you, Barry. Thank you. And thank you to our listeners for uh, witnessing another episode of Hall of Fame Conversations. With that, thank take you, care. John. Thank you, Barry. Thank you very much. God bless. Pleasure.